Welcome to our uh, committee. This is a hearing on the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program, Keeping the Door Open. The committee will come to order, and I will read the mission statement of the Oversight Committee, which reads as follows. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with Citizen Watchdog to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I will uh, just so our uh, panelists and audience can know, uh, we will have a couple of opening statements and then we will swear the witnesses and go into the testimony. And on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you for, uh, for being here. Uh, consensus is not always easy to find in the world in which we live, but I am confident that all of us in this room, uh, regardless of uh, political persuasion, agree on the value of education. I can testify from firsthand experience about the magic and power of education and its ability to transform not just a single life, as important as that is, but also to transform generations of lives. Uh, my parents grew up on a, in a small farming town in South Carolina. My mother's grandfather was a sharecropper. My mother's father had a sixth grade education. My father is the first male to attend college in his family. And he did so by getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and rolling newspapers and delivering them because he dreamed of going to college. And he saved all of his money. And he went and took all the math and science classes he could take at the University of South Carolina. And then when the money ran out, he went to medical school. So when I tell folks back home that my father is a medical doctor, but he's not a college graduate, they don't believe me, but it's true. My father realized that education was his only ticket to a better life, and because of his sacrifices, uh, he changed not only his own life, uh, but the life of my three sisters and me and generations to come. And I have been continually reminded of the power of education in my professional life as a prosecutor. Along with my friends in law enforcement, I have seen almost every form of crime imaginable. The one constant in those 16 years of being a prosecutor is the inextricable link between education or a lack thereof and crime. Yesterday I had the pleasure of meeting with your chief of police in the District of Columbia for, for the second time, but it was a more extended meeting. A wonderful person, uh, very impressed with the department. And what they were doing was coming up with a, a crime reduction strategy for the District of Columbia. And I could not help but think during that meeting that the best crime reduction strategy of all is a high school diploma. So we are here to evaluate the District of Columbia's Opportunity Scholarship Program. And in my judgment, the evidence proves beyond a reasonable doubt the value and the efficacy of this program. The parents overwhelmingly approve of the Opportunity Scholarship Program. They are engaged, they are involved, and they feel vested. Students approve of the program, as evidenced by the fact that demand outpaces supply four to one. Parents value the discipline and learning environment afforded by the Opportunity Scholarship Program. Student performance is, is up both generally, as evidenced by the higher graduation rates, and more particularly as evidenced by their reading scores. Parents value the choices afforded by this program. They don't want to be told their choices are limited because their bank accounts are limited. What is good enough for the highest ranking officials in our country should be good enough for everyone. Even the United States Department of, Justice, Department of Education once lauded the Opportunity Scholarship Program as an example of a program that is working before someone or something told them to think otherwise. 
The residents of the District of Columbia overwhelmingly want choices with respect to the education of their children. The Opportunity Scholarship Program may not be the answer for every student. And this bill acknowledges that by providing ample funding to the public school system, the charter school system, as well as the Opportunity Scholarship Program. But the Opportunity Scholarship Program has been successful in the eyes of the participants, and it is frankly beyond comprehension how there could be opposition to a program that parents like, students want, that produces results, and does nothing to detract from other educational resources. The most compelling piece of evidence in support of this program is the personal testimony of the students and the parents. I have listened as students and parents alike have vouched for this program as a lifesaver and a dream maker. It is one thing to remind parents and children that their income levels are low. I will not be the one to tell them that their dreams are too high. And with that, I would yield to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me first of all congratulate you on your selection as the chairman of this important subcommittee. And I look forward to working and building a very positive relationship with you as we carry out the subcommittee's work. And while I intend to keep my remarks somewhat brief this morning so that I can share some of the time with uh, Congresswoman Norton, I appreciate the Chairman's inaugural hearing on a topic that I care so deeply about and have spent such a great deal of my life focused on, and that is the issue of public education. I would also like to ask unanimous consent that the statements of the National School Boards Association, the National Coalition for Public Education, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, the American Association of School Administrators, the American Civil Liberties Union, and the American Association of University Women in opposition to H.R. 471 be included in the record. Without objection, they will, they will be made part of the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I was intrigued as I listened to you in your opening comments because I, too, like your father, grew up in rural America, went to a one-room school where one teacher, Ms. Beattie King, taught eight grades plus what we call the little prima and the big prima all at the same time. And so I share your commitment to education. However, as a staunch supporter of public education, I am not in favor of escalating private school vouchers at this time because what they mean to me is that fewer taxpayer dollars for traditional schools will be reduced or diminished. However, I am in favor of improving education across the board so that every child in the District of Columbia would have optimal opportunity to have the kind of experience, educational experience, that would prepare him or her for everything that they would want to be, do, and accomplish in life. Improving public education in the District of Columbia, as in the rest of the Nation, has been and will remain a long and difficult climb. The Federal Government has played a critical role in providing the District schools with badly needed funding since 2004. The City deserves recognition for prioritizing turning around its schools and for the improvements it has made. For this reason, I do feel that it would have been helpful for the Committee to have heard from the Mayor of the City and other elected leaders on this important topic. I commend the students and parents here today for their advocacy of expanded educational opportunities and for your personal commitment to getting the best education that you can for yourselves and for your children. However, I am concerned that there are no parents or students here to advocate for the public schools. Families from those schools also have wonderful stories to tell about exceptional teachers and successful, innovative teaching practices. 
allowing Federal dollars to fund private schools diverts attention and resources away from private schools that educate the vast majority of students in our country. If we have limited Federal dollars for education, we should focus on fixing the public schools that aren't performing well and aiding their students rather than undermining those schools by siphoning not only off scarce Federal dollars, but in some instances the mix of students who would add to the dimension and opportunities of acquiring a great education for all. And with that said, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to reserve the balance of my time to be added to that of Representative Norton when she has a time to make her remarks. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, the Chair would recognize the uh, general lady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Holmes Norton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate my uh, very good conversation with Chairman Gowdy. Uh, when I learned that the Chairman had not received two requests, I left with his office on Friday to call me after Mayor Vincent Gray was denied the courtesy that has always been given to the Mayor of the District of Columbia or whatever party controlled the Congress and, for that matter, to most busy, highly placed public officials whose time is charged to the taxpayers. I also learned that Chairman Gowdy did not make the decision concerning the appearance of Mayor Gray. What was gained by denying uh, the Mayor's two separate attempts to get small changes that would have enabled him to testify here today, except to make it impossible for him to testify as a minority witness against the bill before us, or if he did testify to try to humiliate him and to disrespect his office. Instead of the courtesy of a routine accommodation by being placed early enough to be heard, the Mayor was offered the option of being the last witness on a panel with his constituents with no guarantee that it, he could be heard early enough to get back to urgent city business he had offered to push back for a reasonable period. In 20 years of service in the Congress, I have never seen any highly placed public official treated so shabbily. The discourteous response to our Mayor's request was inconsistent with past practice of this committee and its subcommittees. It was offensive, petty, and beneath the dignity of any committee of the Congress. I knew that this response could not have come from the new chairman. As chairman at Chairman Gowdy's re request, I took him to Mayor Gray's office just two weeks ago, and he and the mayor had a very cordial meeting. Considering Mayor Gray's respect for Chairman Gowdy, I know that the mayor wants to put this matter behind him so that he can continue the cordial relationship that began with Chairman Gowdy when Chairman Gowdy visited the mayor's office. I ask unanimous consent that the mayor's statement uh, concerning this bill uh, be entered into the record of today's hearing. Without objection, it will be made part of the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to be clear that my remarks today are addressed to my colleagues, not to my constituents who desire better education. I, too, am a mother, and I cannot blame any parent for taking advantage of any educational opportunity that comes your way. Although I am a proud graduate of the D.C. public schools and strongly support our public schools, I have always supported public charter school alternatives for those parents who are dissatisfied with our traditional public schools. Children cannot wait until public schools now in the throes of a race to the top meet the necessary standards. This is true even though the D.C. public schools have made impressive strides by any measure. For example, notwithstanding the many improvements the D.C. public schools must make, the National Assessment of Education Progress, which recently measured math progress in the Nation's public schools, found the D.C. public schools to be the only schools in the Nation to improve average math scores uh, at both fourth and eighth grade levels by at least five points. However, the Department of Education's final report on the Opportunity Scholarship Program did not report the re results we are seeing in the district's chosen alternatives to our traditional public schools, our public charter schools. 
The Department of Education's report found, and I am quoting, no conclusive evidence that the Opportunity Scholarship Program affected student achievement as measured by standardized reading and math tests, mathematics tests, end quote. Uh, yet this program was established precisely to measure the difference between the academic performance of students in the lowest performing public schools and those in the private school program. Unlike the private schools, our public charter schools, our public charter middle and high schools, with a majority of economically disadvantaged students scored almost twice as high as their D.C. public school counterparts in math and reading, and the graduation rates of charter schools in the district is 24 percent higher than the graduation rates of the public high schools and 8 percent higher than the nationwide graduation rate. Yet our public charter schools have a significantly higher percentage of African Americans and of disadvantaged children than our D.C. public schools. Of particular importance, unlike our private schools, D.C. public schools are fully accountable to the public in measures of performance and in every activity. Both public and public charter schools can and have been closed when acceptable standards have not been met. D.C. public charter schools on average have a remarkable record, but they are quick to concede that, they, that not all of them meet high standards. However, with this record of the D.C.'s own public charter schools, not a couple of thousand students, but almost 28,000 students uh, in these schools, with this record, why would Congress target the District of Columbia for private school vouchers? Moreover, the continuing focus on private school vouchers exclusively for the District of Columbia comes despite a compromise that allows every D.C. student now in the program to be funded until graduation from high school. That compromise, in turn, followed a prior compromise to extend the program two years beyond the authorized five-year cutoff date. What is before us today is uh, the, the startup of a brand new program for new children, and again, only in the District of Columbia. The single minded focus on public funding of private schools only in the district raises many questions. If my Republican colleagues believe private school vouchers are so important, why haven't they used the experiment here in the district to offer a national bill on the floor? allowing school districts that might choose vouchers? Could it be that the majority is influenced by State referenda on vouchers, all of which have been lost by voucher pro pro proponents? Could it be that the Republican majority has read the national polls showing that the American people overwhelmingly oppose public funding of private schools? If the Republican majority is truly concerned about alternatives to public education, why are they not expanding funding for public charter schools, which, uh, has, which have a large congressional bipartisan majority, both in the House and the Senate? The inescapable conclusion is that the Republicans believe they can indulge their personal and ideological preferences with impunity here in the district, uh, 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 a risk they are unwilling to take in their own districts with private school vouchers. The Republicans did not consult the district's elected officials before introducing a bill to start up a new voucher program. Yet the desperate budget situation in the district has put most in the Council in the position of appearing to reverse their position against vouchers that they previously took in letters to me when D.C. residents mounted one of the largest protests during my I ask unanimous consent to complete my remarks. Reserving the right to object, uh, how much longer does a gentlelady expect to talk? Uh, the gentlelady expects to talk only about a minute longer. I ask unanimous consent for one additional minute. One additional minute. I, I thank the gentleman. There is a history that and I appreciate it. Um, um, I, I was speaking of the reversal of some members of the Council on the position they previously took, opposing vouchers and letters to me. Uh, at, at a time when a huge demonstration was mounted here in the Congress uh, by residents against imposing uh, vouchers on the district. 
Uh, they can hardly be blamed for this change of mind. They certainly know that it would do very little good to lobby the, the House for any new funding for the home rule choice of our parents for independent public school alternatives. Uh, however, uh, it is exactly, this is exactly what Speaker Newt Gingrich did. When he first mentioned private school vouchers to me, I told him of public opposition to vouchers in the city, but not to public charter schools. Um, th uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am going to use my, my time to question witnesses to complete my statement. I think this is an important history for people to understand. Yes, ma'am. You are welcome to do that. The Chair would uh, recognize Uh, we will now go to the testimony, and it is my pleasure to uh, introduce the panel. I will introduce the panel in whole, and then we will start with you, Mr. Halassi, and go in that order. How is that? Does that sound good? All right. We are That's pleased good. to have Mr. Ronald Halassi, who is a senior at Archbishop Carroll High School and a District of Columbia Opportunity Scholarship Program recipient since the sixth grade. Uh, to his left and uh, our right is Ms. Leslie Alvarez. She is an eighth grader at Sacred Heart School and a D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program recipient. Ms. Sheila Jackson is the mother of an OSP student, Shawnee, who is in the tenth grade at Preparatory School of District of Columbia. And Ms. Latasha Bennett is a single mother of two children. Nico received an Opportunity Scholarship Program, while Nia was one of the 216 students whose scholarship was retracted. However, through donations her family receives, Nia is able to attend the same school as her brother. Welcome to all four of you. And, Mr. Halassi, we will recognize you for your five-minute opening statement. Uh, before we do that, uh, let us, because uh, it is a policy of the committee to swear the witnesses, we will ask you to uh, rise and lift your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect all witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated, and Mr. Halassi, you may begin. Chairman Gowdy and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Ronald Halassi. I have served as D.C.'s Deputy Youth Mayor for Legislation for two years. I am now a senior at Archbishop Carroll High School. My journey with the Washington, D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program began six years ago when I was 13. I was raised in a single-parent household with my mother and younger brother. I faced many challenges in the public school system. I attended various D.C. public schools during elementary school altercations with other students and a lack of academic achievement resulted in me switching to different schools around D.C., but it seemed that I was faced with the same problems at each new school. Then one day my mother saw an ad for the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program. She quickly applied, and soon after I was accepted and given a scholarship to attend any private school of our choice in D.C. My mother now had a chance to send me to a school she knew would fit me best. The scholarship covered tuition, books, and my uniform. My mother saw it as a blessing and an answer of prayer from God for a child. She always wanted me to have a quality education. When I received my scholarship, I was so far behind that the school asked me to repeat the sixth grade. The first few months were very different as the expectations and standards were much higher. The discipline in the school was also much stricter. Adjusting to the new school wasn't easy. It took time. I had to catch up and get on the academic level I needed to be on and fulfill the expectations of the new school. But it all didn't happen that fast. It took some years and hard work and dedication. There was a transition stage that I had to undergo. It took some time to adjust to the new standards and expectations, but I soon adjusted well. When I entered high school, I was quite nervous and didn't really know what to expect. Being at Archbishop Carroll High School shaped me academically. 
shaped me to perform academically with my greatest potential. As I am now a senior at Archbishop Carroll High School, finishing up my last year, I am ready to take on the world and new opportunities. I credit the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program for my success. This program has worked, is still working, and will continue to work. It is a must to reauthorize the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program. Everyone deserves a choice and should have the right of school choice and opportunity. As I said before unto the United States Senate, public schools did not get bad overnight and they are not going to get better overnight. So we need to take action now and have a program installed to give children a quality education, such as the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program. Reauthorization of the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program is critical. We should always have options, and this program is an option for parents and students. Looking back, I can see throughout the year, past years, I have evolved so much and at the same time dealt with many obstacles. As a young child, many challenges came before me in which I had to undergo hardships and persevere. Through all the pain, suffering, and tears, I am still standing, not just standing, but standing strong to take on the world and achieve much more. As a young man, I see a future ahead of me and a vision of a successful life. I feel as if all these years served as preparation for the real world. I am now confident that I can go out into the world and make something out of my life, and that I will not only impact people here in the United States, but around the world. I made it this far, and nothing can stop me now from succeeding. Not a single voice or action of opposition can stop my success, nor the success of thousands of children who have the opportunity to choose a school that is best for them. It's not just about me and my story as I am now a senior, months away from graduating. I'm here for not only myself and the students currently enrolled in the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program, but the thousands of children who have not been given the same opportunity. I am here to fight for quality education and have the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program reauthorized as it needs to be. I am a product of this program, a successful result. The DC Opportunity Scholarship Program has provided the education that has shaped me into being the intelligent, ambition person that is in front of you all now. The results of the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program are certainly life changing. Now, being a young adult, taking on my own responsibilities, I have certainly been greatly influenced by this program. I can look back and credit this program for my success. It is not just what this program does academically but it is how it impacts an individual's life through education. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Halassi. Ms. Alvarez, we will recognize you for your opening statement. Hi, Chairman Gowdy. Hello, Ranking Member Davis and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to tell my story today. My name is Leslie Alvarez. I am an eighth grade Opportunity Scholarship student. I live at home with my mother, father, and brother. At home, we speak Spanish and English. English is my second language. I learned it while attending Sacred Heart School. Both languages are taught at Sacred Heart because it is a bilingual school. In fact, it is the only bilingual Catholic school in all of DC. Sacred Heart is a very special and unique place. My classmates and I represent a lot of different countries, for example, El Salvador, Mexico, Nicaragua, Cameroon, Barbados, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and Vietnam. Also, we share different religious backgrounds. There are Catholic and Buddhist students, and there are Protestant students like me. The common thread between us all is that we are all learning to be responsible citizens of our school community and the greater community. My teachers are very proud of me for testifying on behalf of our school community today. I am very involved in my school. A minimum of 20 hours of community service is needed in order to graduate eighth grade. I only have two hours left. My favorite subject in school is language arts. I love it so much because there is reading involved. I am able to grasp the material quickly and connect stories to my life. I am definitely planning on attending college in my future. I am sure that I want to make something out of my life and be successful. I am interested in studying law. I think I would be a good lawyer because I am a persuasive arguer and fight for what I believe in. The main reason why I find interest in law is because I like defending people and I stand up for justice. One of my favorite books is En Busca de Milagros. In English, this translates as In Search of Miracles. 
am reading this book right now in my Spanish class. It is so powerful and has changed the way I look at my life and my future. I connect with the main character, Millie, short for Milagros, in a couple of ways. The first way is that we are both searching for something. Being an adopted child, Millie is searching for knowledge of her past. Being an Opportunity Scholar, I am searching for knowledge for my future. The Opportunity Scholarship Program has been a miracle for me and hundreds of students like me. Millie wants to know where she comes from. I want to know where I'm going. With my scholarship, I know I will go far. Millie and I have one more thing in common. We are young, and a lot of people tell us that we are too young to overcome the obstacles set in front of us. Millie's successful story showed me that I should just keep working and get through the obstacles. I know I cannot change the minds of the adults who doubt the value of the Opportunity Scholarship Program, but like Millie, I know that I need to work hard every day to overcome my obstacles and demonstrate the value of my scholarship so that more kids like me can receive it too. There are a couple of ways that Millie and I are different. First, Millie finds only two adults who help support her on her journey. I have more than two people helping me. I have my parents and teachers. I know that Cardinal World is supportive of me, and there are many members of Congress, like Speaker Boehner and Senator Lieberman, who support me in this program. The second way we are different is that it took Millie until the middle of her story to learn she could not control the world around her, and that she just needed to take control of her actions and be really dedicated to get her a miracle. In my case, I feel like I am still in the beginning of my life story. I still have a lot of years of education ahead of me. In order to achieve my dreams, but unlike Millie, I will not wait to take control of my actions until later. I am taking control today by testifying. Millie's miracle comes to her because eventually her work leads her to learn about her past. The miracle that I am searching for today is that the Opportunity Scholarship Program be reauthorized. I know other kids will enjoy their scholarship as much as I have. My name is Leslie Alvarez, and I am in Busca de Milagro. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alvarez. Uh, we will recognize Ms. Jackson for her five-minute opening statement. Chairman Gowdy, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. I am a single parent of two. I have a 15-year-old daughter who is and has been a recipient of the Opportunity Scholarship for six years. I was educated in the South and experienced racism firsthand. I attended segregated schools until I began high school. I prayed that when I became a mother, my child or children would never have to experience racism on the level I did. As a young girl, I remember waking <coughs> excuse me, in the middle of the night to scream at neighbors because a cross was burning on their lawn. I also have memories of being told that I could not use the restroom in public buildings while shopping with my mother because I was not the appropriate skin color watching the Ku Klux Klan parading in our neighborhood just because they could. The list goes on. But in spite of all the racial negativity surrounding me, I vowed that I would not let it hamper my growth and that when I did have children, I would provide the best I could and that they would have the best education possible. In spite of all my efforts, my daughter now faces another form of segregation. To segregate her from attending a school of my choice and is this, that is best suited for her just because some politicians feel that my, my child and many others who are currently recipients of the Opportunity Scholarship do not deserve the quality education their children receive. Why? That is a question we parents would all like an answer to. I am disabled and I live on a fixed income. If this program is not reauthorized, it would be impossible for me to pay tuition to the private Christian school my daughter currently attends. The Opportunity Scholarship Program has been the difference to her having to attend schools that are not safe and are still underperforming to her attending a school that meets her needs and where I know she is safe. My daughter attended D.C. public schools through fourth grade. I was not pleased with the overcrowded classrooms, teachers having to share teacher aides, purchase school supplies with their own money, children so unruly the police had to be called because they were a threat to the rest of the student body. During her fourth grade year, I had taken as much as I could. She was struggling in math, and her teacher was not willing to do anything outside of her plan 
to help my daughter. We went back and forth, with her teacher accusing me of trying to run her classroom. She blankly told me that if my daughter did not get it, then she was sorry. I agreed with her that she was sorry if she was not willing to do what she was there for to educate the students in her charge. I was determined I would not allow this school system to fail my child, and I knew that if she continued in the D.C. public school system, that would surely be the case. The school she attended was an underperforming school, as were most of the schools in my ward. I requested a meeting with the principal, and that meeting was granted. In attendance were her teacher, the principal, and myself. After hearing from her teacher and my principal and myself, he was in agreement with me that her teacher was not doing enough to help my daughter. I learned about tutoring options for low-income families under the No Child Left Behind program. I applied for my daughter, and she was accepted. After an assessment of her tutor, it was discovered that she was intimidated by math. Ms. Johns, her tutor, who is currently a professor at the University of Oklahoma, worked with my daughter through the remainder of the school year. There was a tremendous improvement in her math grades. That was her last year in the D.C. public school system. During that year, I learned about and applied for the Opportunity Scholarship, and Shawnee was accepted. She is now a sophomore in high school, attending the Preparatory School of D.C., an honor roll student, and making plans for college. Not only has the Opportunity Scholarship provided me a choice for my daughter, but also for thousands of other parents. I stand today asking that the Opportunity Scholarship Program be reauthorized and be open to new students as well. My motto is simple, walk good and journey safe that our children will, be, will continue to be afforded the opportunity to have a good walk through their education and all their educational journeys be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. The Chair will recognize Ms. Bennett for her five-minute opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Gowdy and members of the committee and supporters. Thank you for allowing me to share my family's story regarding the need to continue the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program and for it to be reauthorized. My name is Latasha Bennett. I am a 39-year-old single parent of two very intelligent children. My son, Nico Thomas, here today is nine years old and attends Naylor Road Private School, where he is in the fourth grade and he is excelling. My daughter, Nia Thomas, is six years old, and she also attends Naylor Road, thanks to generous private donations where we have truly been blessed to receive. Without these donations, I do not know where my daughter would be going to school. I am currently unemployed due to a disability. I worked from the age of 14 until the year 2000 when I became disabled. Because of the inability for me to work, the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program has been a true blessing for me, for myself and my son and our family. Nico is thriving academically in his school and loving it. The students in Nico's class get more hands-on from the teacher because there are only nine students in his class. Students are given so much more attention and they learn twice as much in their class. I don't want to see my son's dreams of becoming a doctor washed down the drain because he is forced to attend a school that does not meet his needs. I applied for the scholarship for Nia so she could attend Naylor Road School for the 20, for the 2009-10 school year. I have received a letter of authorization granting Nia a scholarship and I was so elated. Then a month or two later, a retraction letter came. It was like a nightmare. I was appalled. I felt, I felt a bit of injustice not only to my daughter, but to all of the other children as well. I, I, I felt like the system had failed my baby before she had been given a chance to even begin her dreams. I was totally devastated and angry that my child was denied an opportunity to attend the school along with her brother, a school where she would be safe and get a quality education. Why, why shouldn't my child be given the same opportunity as your children 
to, go, to get the best opportunity possible, education possible? Is my child not worthy of getting what, sh what so many of our ancestors fought for years ago? My daughter has dreams of being a famous dancer and singer, and I motivate her dreams because as long as she has a dream, there's a chance for a, a good future. I want Nia to have the same opportunity to excel well as her brother in the same, in the same way that she has big dreams to excel. I want that also for other students. Nia is so looking forward to going to this college, going to college in the future. She continues to ask me, Mom, will I go to school with my brother next year? I used to answer and tell her yes. Now I don't know what will I tell her. I know that I cannot count on private donations to send her to Naylor Road for the remainder of her time in school, but I look forward to my child. I, but I look, for, I look at my child, excuse me, and see she is so happy that I can't bring myself to express doubt. I believe you, Chairman Gowdy, and the members of the committee know how it feels when your child is so happy that their little faces light up and you can't bring yourself to cause that light to go out. We are looking to those of you who have power to continue this program and ensure that our children have the opportunity to get the type of education they deserve. Without the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program, I pray daily that I will have peace of mind to know, because I don't know where I would truly send my daughter to school. I know for certain it will not be any schools in my area I have seen what happens in, to the children in neighborhood schools that fall through the cracks. I lost my nephew to a neighborhood school. I will not lose my children when they are so bright and willing to learn and be productive citizens. Please allow my children to continue this opportunity through the Opportunity Scholarship Program to have a bright and better future by continuing this program. Education is the number one priority besides God in my household. And by reauthorizing the DC Opportunity Scholarship, so many parents and children like myself will have hope for a better future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bennett. Uh, I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes for questions and want to start by saying what I'm sure most of the people in the room know, but it, it may bear amplification, which is the D.C. Otter, uh, Opportunity Scholarship Program does not take one red cent from the D.C. public school system. And to argue otherwise um, is disingenuous at best. This is not an argument about whether or not we're going to fund all three layers of the D.C. school system. It is about whether we are going to give the same choice to poor folk that rich folk have. So against that backdrop, uh, let me ask Mr. Hallisey and Ms. Alvarez to do what is sometimes hard even for adults to do, which is imagine uh, circumstances are different. I want you to imagine um, if, you, if there were no D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program, do you have friends whose lives um, have taken a different path because they didn't have the same opportunities you did. We'll start with you, Mr. Hallistein, then we'll go to you, Ms. Alvarez. Yes, absolutely. Some of my friends that actually went back into the public school system completely changed. And you can see that they're, some of them are on the street. Some of them don't really know what colleges they're going to. Some haven't even applied to college. So it's a big difference. Ms. Alvarez? Yes, um, I had some friends that used to go to the Sacred Heart with me, but now they attend public schools and they just don't know what to do. They haven't, some haven't even applied to high school, so it's, it's just sad. Ms. Jackson and Ms. Bennett, if I understood your testimony correctly, it was that if you were uh, persons of means, if money were not an issue in life, you would choose to go to the private schools that your children are going to. Is that correct? That is correct for me, sir. I, would, I firmly believe that it should be a choice of where I send my daughter to school, where I feel it is safe for her, where her educational needs are met. And right now, where she is, I feel that everything she needs is met there. She's safe. I don't worry about her during the day, whether a fight is going to break out or whether the police will have to be called. I'm very comfortable 
with the environment that she's in. Ms. Bennett? Likewise, I also am, if it, as you asked, if it had not been for the funding, I am totally um, approved and I'm appreciated of this uh, school that I chose, that I had the opportunity to choose for my children, for one, because of the safety, because of the teachers' commitments to teach the children, and the the grades that my children are getting. I brought today, for an example, Nia being, she have donations, made all A's in the first grade, and is writing in cursive, which I know we started like in third grade, and if I had the funds, I would pay for better education for my child, but so, I don't. So the only reason that Ms. Jackson and Ms. Bennett are here, they have already, you have already made the choice in your mind. If you were people of means, you wouldn't have to come before a congressional committee and ask for this program. Not at all. Um, can you fashion any reason why poor folk or folk who are not wealthy enough to attend private school on their own should have fewer choices than rich folk? I don't see any reason why not, because I think that our children should be able to get the same education and allow the same education, um, be it that we are poor or not. We just can't afford to give our children that education. And if most people empathize that are wealthier and put themselves in our shoes, I, I believe that they would think differently to reauthorize this program. Mr. Halassi, you are pleased with your educational experience? Yes, I am. Ms. Alvarez, you are pleased with your educational experience? Yes, I am. Ms. Jackson, you are pleased with your children's educational experience? Yes, I am, sir. Ms. Bennett, you are pleased with your children's educational experience? I am pleased with Nico. I ask that and pray that you all reauthorize because I can't guarantee donations for NIA's continued, but I am pleased that both of them are on the honor roll. You are pleased with the environment from a safety and security and an environment conducing with, conducive with learning? You are pleased with that aspect of your school? I am pleased with every aspect of the school Ms. that Jackson? I chose. Yes, I am, sir. I am pleased as well that the school she currently attends has a family atmosphere. They not only care about the education of the students, but they are helping to groom those boys and girls into young men and women, and I am very pleased with that. Ms. Alvarez, you are pleased? Yes, I am. I feel safe in my school. Mr. Halassi, you are pleased? Yes, I am. As my principal, Dr. Stouffer, enforces every day to have a safe environment for us all. all right, the Chair would recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me thank all four of you for your tremendous uh, comments and statements, and I seriously appreciate them. Ms. Jackson and Ms. Bennett, both of you indicated that there is a serious difference between the schools that your children currently attend and the schools that they attended <coughs> earlier. Could you share with us what those differences are? Uh, yes. Mr. Davis, the last school my daughter attended in the D.C. public school system was Magogny Elementary School, which is in Ward 8, where we were living at the time. We actually lived next door to the school, so I had a full view of the outside activity, not knowing what was going on in the inside. Being disabled, I was at home a big portion of the day and often would see police cars pulling into the parking lot which would give me great fear because I did not know what was going on with the, in, in the student body inside. And this happened on a daily basis. The school that she is currently attending and the school that she previously attended before her current school were both private Christian schools. When I leave her or when she leaves me in the morning and she steps into the school, I don't worry. I know that she, her educational needs are going to be met. I know that she's going to be safe. I know that if anything happens, that I will be contacted to know that maybe she's fallen and had an accident. I didn't get that in the D.C. public school system. 
She had come home on numerous days saying that someone had taken something from her. She was afraid to say anything to the student for fear of being beaten up. So there is a big difference in the education she has had over the past six years and the first four years of her education in D.C. public school system. Ms. Bennett. Okay. I can say um, Nico only had one year experience in public schools. And that one year, he went to Clark Elementary, which was in Ward 4, which we had lived at that moment. And I was pregnant with my daughter. I was a high-risk pregnancy. Therefore, I was unable to work. And I, one of those um, apron string moms, and I frequently went up to Nico's school, which he was in pre-K, and they Every, every, and I can honestly say every entrance to the school, be it the side entrance, because his class was um, excessive to the outside, um, their playground, the doors were open. I would go through just to see. And one time I even drove up to the school and parked on the side. And the students were actually on the playground by themselves just because a door was open to their classroom. And after that, and I had several questions for the teachers why Nico wasn't learning more than what he had learned at home. They couldn't give me any answers, and I wanted more for my child, and I took him out of the public school. Well, let me ask you, are the same children going to the same schools? Are the children that you my, my two children? Yes. Yes, they both attend Naylor Road. Only Nia does through donations that I won't be able to. Are any of the students who attended their prior school also attending this school? Um, not to my knowledge. Uh, Ms. Jackson, do you know if any of the same children are attending with your ch child? Children from D.C. public schools? Yes. No, there aren't. And so the schools that your children currently attend, are they much smaller? Smaller are classes, they, yes. Yes. Are, are the students perhaps more selective? I notice that the students, excuse me, I notice that the students are very intelligent from the teaching which even my son re received. I noticed that because I did volunteer up their school several times, that a lot of the, the, the students did come from public schools. And it's the parents that chose to take advantage of the opportunity. And the classes are smaller, so there is more hands-on teaching. And, and you have indicated that these are both Christian schools, your charter Christian? My son and Nia goes to a private school. It is not, not religious-based. None of them are charters. They are all private. To my knowledge. Yes. Yes. My school is a private school. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Davis. The uh, chair would recognize the uh, gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. Thank you. Um, I also come from a state that is struggling with education. Um, I'm also from rural um, America, uh, from a town of a thousand. That's where I got my education, and I saw uh, what it takes as a community to, uh, to educate. My question to you, Ms. Bennett, Ms. Jackson, is, is that um, why would you find it um, a problem not to have a choice in able to dictating where your child goes to school? Would you see a problem? I, I see a problem with not having a choice because that takes away, first of all, my my, lip, my own liberty that we are supposed to have to choose. And it is a problem to me to not have that choice to choose because I want what is best for my child, just like other people choose to send their children where they choose to. It is just that I am not financially fit to pay for what I choose. So that is a problem for me. Ms. Jackson. Uh, I agree in whole with Ms. Bennett. I, I want the choice to have my child have a quality education, just as wealthy Americans make the choices to send their children to private schools that they know are safe, where they are going to receive a quality education. I feel my daughter deserves nothing less, and I want to continue to have that choice, although I am also not financially able to make those payments to a private school 
but I'd like to continue to have the choice to send my daughter to a school that works for her. Let me continue. Um, would, you, would you look at the public education system um, and uh, say it is a success, as it currently is right now? Honestly, I would say no. I have, just to be brief, I have nephews and a niece that goes to the local school in my area, and I frequently go with my sister to the school because they are calling almost twice a week or three times a week because of incidents that are happening at the school. Either somebody is trying to beat up my nephew or beat up my niece, they are twins. And this is a D.C. public school. And I had almost got frustrated with not knowing about the Opportunity Scholarship Program continuing, that I had almost applied to that school. And I sat in there for 30 minutes. And after seeing what was going on, I honestly left out and left the papers on the table. And I said, no matter what, if they didn't reauthorize this program, I would te home teach my daughter, other than to have her in an environment that is not safe. And that, I mean, I, I saw teachers and things that you wouldn't even believe happening. And this isn't the first time. I am just really passionate about this. And I think that the D.C. public school system is not a bad school system, but it needs great improvement. And I believe that at this time, it would not satisfy me or satisfy the needs of my daughter for her to be in the D.C. public school system. As Mr. Halassi stated, the school system didn't get that way overnight, and it's not going to be fixed overnight. So it's going to take a while to get it back to where it should be. I believe that the school system could be a great school system mm -hmm. if all the efforts are put forth and things are done to make it better. But right now, no, I don't think it's the school system that, or I know it's not the school system that I would want my child in at this time. One last point. It seems to me that on, on education, there has to be the family input, an important segment that we've never really try to, to involve in public sector, in the public uh, school district. Um, and with my education, everything is results-based um, as, a, as a doctor. Um, and when we look at positive results, could you see any way, um, as, a, as a parent, the opportunity for choice gives you the opportunity for success in the educational model? I believe so. I believe that because of the, the disarray that the D.C. public school system is in and the choice that I have chosen and the choice that I have been able to take has been a difference in her quality of education, her grades. Her grades have gravely improved in the six years that she has been out of the D.C. public school system. And I just know that because of this, that is why her grades are there, where, the, where she attends school. I know in my heart, in my soul, that because she was out of the D.C. public school system, that these grades that she is making, the career choices that she is thinking about, are because of the choice of her being in a school that cares about what she learns and what she, where she goes in her future. And I agree with Ms. Jackson, um, it's evident by the report cards that I have here that my children are excelling in the schools that I, the school that I chose for them to go to, um, and I was very vigorously searching when I was choosing. And and it's if if they had not had that opportunity, or I had not had the opportunity to choose. I don't believe they would be making these same grades and as motivated to be what they want to be in the future. Thank you, Dr. Gozar. The chair would rec uh, recognize the general lady from the District of Columbia, Representative Holmes Norton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to congratulate the achievements of my young constituents uh, and clearly against the odds. Very proud of you. I want to congratulate the parents. You should know what parents are supposed to do. Uh, the most important factor 
in student achievement is passion of the parents for that achievement, and I know that well. Ms. Jackson, I graduated from segregated schools in the District of Columbia. I went to Bruce Monroe uh, in ele elementary school. I went to Banneker when it was a junior high school. I am a proud graduate of Dunbar High School. Um, schools then um, were perhaps better. There was a large population here in the District of Columbia. Um, I love the D.C. public schools. They are doing much better, but you will never find that this Congresswoman is an apologist for anything that offers uh, less than quality education to, uh, our, uh, ch to our children. Uh, Mr. Halasi, I want you, I am proud that you are about to graduate. I hope you know about D.C. TAG. Yes, I do. All right. D.C. <laughs> TAG is the 100 percent funded. Federal program that allows our youngsters to go to any public college anywhere in the United States. And that program has doubled college attendance here. And Mr. Halassi, whether you choose a public or private school, anybody that gets you is going to get a lot of quality. I am going to use the remainder of my time simply to put on the record what the record is for this program. And I appreciate the time that was given me in my opening remarks. I, I was speaking about uh, Speaker Gingrich, who approached me about school vouchers. And I told him of public opposition to vouchers in the city, but not to public charter schools, as demonstrated by a fledgling charter school law in the district that had attra attracted only a few charters. The result was PL 104-134, which included the School Reform Act of 1995 passed here in the Congress that has produced what amounts to a large-scale, robust, alternative public school system that has become a model for the Nation with almost half of our children in attendance. The long waiting lists of our public charter schools are the best evidence of their quality and their embrace by our parents and residents as the school's own home rule choice. Our public charter schools uh, are where both the need and the demand are. Why then set up a congressionally sponsored private school program for the city? Why, when ours is the only big city with both rapidly improving public schools and a model alternative public charter school system? Why, when the city is one of the few jurisdictions in the nation that has no barriers to public school alternatives? Why isn't the District of Columbia being rewarded with funding to continue to build the city's public charter schools and to respond to the waiting lists of parents that can't get in, can't enroll their students? The answer is power, the same congressional power that stripped the city of its vote on the first day of this session that also seeks to reimpose anti-democratic amendments on the city in the pending appropriation bills. It is time that this power respected D.C. democracy. We appreciate congressional interest in our children. We ask only for congressional respect for the people of the District of Columbia who have built their own alternative to our public schools. Any new funding for education in the district should reinforce the hard work of our own parents and residents who have shown the Nation that they know how to build a popular alternative public school system with a dazzling variety of public charter schools, from the nationally renowned KIPP schools uh, to Hospitality High, from the Latin Charter School uh, to the SEED Residential Charter School. D.C. residents know what to do without the benefit of congressional paternalism instruction or intervention. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The Chair would recognize the uh, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, panel, for coming today. I, uh, I want you all to do me a big favor. Put a big smile on your faces. <laughs> this should be such a happy, happy hearing. And believe me, I have sat in a number of hearings that are not happy. Uh, you all are a huge success story. You all are 
especially you two right there. You are the future. You are the future. You are the face of education in this country. Um, I come from Illinois. In Illinois, we have a new mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel. And I think a couple days ago, Mr. Emanuel was asked, where is he going to send his kids to school now that he's moving back to Chicago? And I believe his answer, and I don't want to get it wrong, was, I, I, I don't know, it could be public, could be private, could be religious, could be charter, um, but that is going to be the decision my wife and I make, and I, I would just ask that you respect that decision. How refreshing. I want you to do something that might be terribly, yes, clap. Do something that the four of you might not want to do. Pretend you are politicians for a minute. Put on your political hats. Try to give me short answers. Politicians don't give short answers. Do your best. Um, why do you think it is that there are people in this country, think like a politician, that don't want you to have this choice? Be brief. Think like a politician. Why is it that people don't want to give you that choice? Let's start here. Well, I feel as if how could you oppose of such program as No, 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 Mr. Hollisey, with all due respect, that's not what I asked. Oh. But you know what? You're going to make a good politician because you didn't answer the question. <laughs> I, want, I want a straight, direct answer out of you. Why do you think it is that there are people who don't want you to have this choice? Simple. Why? Other priorities. What? Come give, before. give me one priority that might come before before your parents having that choice? It can be political decisions. Political. Ms. Alvarez, why do you think there are some people that don't want your parents to have a choice? I really don't understand why they wouldn't want us to have the choice or my parents to have the choice. It's, I don't understand. It's just not a right choice to make, to not want our parents to put us in a good school. Ms. Jackson, be political for me. <laughs> Come on. Why do you think it is there are people that do not want you to have that choice, this choice? Come on. Um, honestly speaking, sir, I believe they don't even know why, truly. They don't want our children to have the same valued and um, quality education as their children do. It's all politics, and if you get right down to it, it stems from money. Maybe I have asked a bad question. If you, had, if, you, if you had to guess, Ms. Bennett, and you can start, who doesn't want you to have that choice? Who do you think it is that doesn't want you to have this choice? It is probably, the, to me, it is probably the NEA. The NEA is who? The National Education Association. The teachers' unions. And it is probably the uh, public schools, of course, the public school and private school sector. And it is the opposers that know that this program works. All right, now this is getting a little fun. Now, play, <laughs> Ms. Bennett, play a game with me. If, take the teachers' unions. Okay. Just think off the top of your head why would they not want parents to ultimately have choice? Because they would choose what is better for their kids. And if they did that, what might happen? They would lose a lot of their jobs because they would take them and put them to the private schools and take them out. We are getting the somewhere. <laughs> Um, if, oh, and I'm running out of time. Uh, uh, if this program succeeds, Ms. Alvarez, if, if, D, if the DC scholarship program succeeds, uh, what will that show people? It will show people that, <clears throat> excuse me, it will show people that our kids, uh, uh, everybody, the kids have a future and have something to look forward to. Mr. Hollisey, who would be afraid of the fact that the program might succeed? People who are in opposition of this program. Um, and our, our ranking member uh, very eloquently, I thought, said that this is an issue all about power. Mm. And it is about power. I think the nuance that I would add is that when it comes to educating our kids, who should have that power? Pretty simple question, right? When it comes to educating our kids, 
should it be us up here? No. Uh, should it be the teachers? Should it be the administrators? Should it be the governor? Should it be who should have the power, the power when it comes to deciding where a child goes to school? This should be a one word answer. Ms. Bennett? The parents. Ms. Jackson? I agree. With Ms. Alvarez, who should have that power? I agree with the parents. You're not going to dissent, are you, Mr. Halsey? <laughs> he wouldn't Karen. dare. Thank you. Thank you all four for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Uh, the Chair would recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee, uh, the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. I, uh, as I listen to the witnesses, I am very impressed, and I want to thank all of you for being here. And I don't want us to be confused by what's happening here today. Um, I think it's a disservice to a person like Ms. Holmes Norton for anybody to even remotely imply, and for me and for others, that we don't want people to have choice. The only way that I am here today as a son of two former sharecroppers with less than a sixth grade education is because of an education. So we get that. We also get that this week $890 million from the general education budget is going to be slashed. That is real. And I think the thing that we confuse is this. Mr. Hallisey and Ms. Alvarez, we want every single child <clears throat> to have the opportunity that you have. Every one. We want all 70, 74,000 in D.C. to have that. I want them in my community. I live in the inner city of Baltimore. I had a school right now. I am the president of a public school. My daughter went to charter school, and that charter school, and I was on the board of that charter school for four years. That charter school started out 10 years ago, and now it is one of the best schools in the entire city. I sit on the board of the KIPP school. I know what can be done when we pull our heads together to help children achieve. So <clears throat> it is not a question. Let us not be confused. It is not a question of whether folk don't want people to have choices. When it came to my daughter going to school, I made sure she got a good education. And I, I, I applaud you, Ms. Bennett, and I applaud you, Ms. Jackson, because we have to be the number one advocate for our children. And I have said it many times. Our children only have one chance. This is their turn. This is their turn to get an education. And so I hope you, I mean, I, I mean as much as I appreciate the scholarship program, I want it for every kid. And Mr. Halesi? Is this correct? You know, when, I, when you were asked the question about what happened to some of your friends who may have gone into the public schools, stayed in the public schools, I know what you are talking about. I live in the inner city. I see every day what happens. And, 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 and you are right. You want a safe environment. And you can bet your bottom dollar that most members of Congress, their kids go to schools in a safe environment. You can bet your bottom dollar that they do have the choices. Well, I think that what we should want, all of us, before we start cutting $890 million from the education budget, we need to be concentrating on how do we make sure that every single child is properly educated. The greatest threat to our national security in this country is our failure to properly educate every single child, every one of them. And when we fail to do that, then we have the situation where we have young men in the Baltimore prisons with less than a sixth grade reading level. They look just as sharp and good as you do, sitting behind some bars with a hat turned backwards and pants hanging down. And that's why I applaud you. And, I, and, and that's why you all are such an inspiration to me and to others to fight for opportunity. But sadly, in our country, not everybody has all those choices. And I'm just wondering, you know, I look at the charter schools, and 
D.C. has made some tremendous strides, and I'm not saying that those strides are being made fast enough. But I think I just want to make sure we don't lose sight of the, somebody asked the question and said, well, you know, is any of the same kids from, from the school, uh, private school, I think it was Mr. Davis, from the public school now going to the private school? And the answer was no. And the fact is, is that for every one of those, those children that get a chance to go to these private schools, they're probably, I, I don't know how many, but hundreds of thousands, I guess, maybe hundreds, who don't get that chance. And so if we're going to do anything, we need to be working together to make sure that every child has those opportunities so that everyone can become all that God meant for them to be. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Uh, the Chair would recognize the distinguished gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, and congratulations on your first hearing as a subcommittee chair. Uh, Thank you all for your testimony. I have been able to watch part of it on TV, and I was in for part of uh, the, the remainder. Uh, Mr. Lassie. Yes. You are a senior. Yes, I am. Where are you going to college? Well, I am waiting for the decision letters to be mailed back. So, um, Where did you apply to? I applied to University of Central Florida, um, University of South Florida, University of Miami, Florida Atlantic University, um, Florida <laughs> Institute of Technology. <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of Florida schools. <laughs> was it because of Snowmageddon? <laughs> was it because of all the snow we had last year? <laughs> Somewhat. I just love the environment. Well, that's great. So how many colleges did you apply to? It seems about six to seven. Bethune-Cookman is another one I'm applying to. Okay. Okay. Ms. Alvarez. Yes. Where do you want to go to college? Um, I know it's a little early, <laughs> but I bet you know. A couple places. Where, where I know Mount St. Mary's and, like he said, um, FIU Florida International. That's in my school. Oh, excellent, excellent. Okay. So, Mr. Halassi, so the DC Opportunity Scholarship. What has it meant to you? Just sum it up for us. Life-changing experience. I wouldn't be the person that I am right here before you all if it wasn't for the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program. To life-changing. Yes. It changed me as an individual, as a person. Why? Why? Why did it change you? It, it's, it's just money. H how does this actually affect your life? It's the, as I stated in my testimony, it's yeah. not just what this program does academically, but it's how it impacts an individual through education. And that's what it has done for me. Okay. Ms. Alvarez, you mentioned that you had uh, parental involvement that actually made this happen. Are there other folks in your family who have been involved in your life and, and encourage you? Yes, all of my, my family, my grandparents, my uncles, my aunts, every, all of my family have always been encouraging me to f go for my future and make the best out of it. Mr. Lassie, is that your same experience? Others in your family encouraging you? Yes, yes, others in my family certainly encourage me. Okay, okay. Well, it's, um, it's interesting because um, so, Mr. Lassie, you, when you came in to sixth grade, you said you had to repeat sixth grade. Yes, I had to because the public school system basically failed me. I wasn't successful in the public school system. Are you now prepared to go to college? Yes, I am. All right. Uh, Ms. Alvarez? Yes. How long, have you been, uh, how long have you been receiving the D.C. scholarship? Since 2004. Uh, since 2004. Was that first year yes. really tough? No, it wasn't. <laughs> I think you're bragging too. <laughs> um, well, you know, not just having your parents involved makes such a huge difference. But, um, Ms. Alvarez, you mentioned that Sacred Heart Schools are the only bilingual Catholic school in the D.C. area. Correct. Um, how important is it for you to have that choice of, of having a bilingual school? It's important because at the same time I don't lose my background of Spanish from where I come from, but yet I get the, the language of English. So it's, I still have both languages in my life. So I also ask Ms. Mr. Alassi this, Ms. Alvarez, um, are you prepared, I ask if he's prepared to go to, to college, are you prepared to go to high school? Yes, certainly. And where are you going to go? Um, I got two acceptance letters, one from St. John's and one from Carroll, but I'm choosing Carroll. 
Do you think that is a good choice, Mr. Lassie? <laughs> <It's easy. laughs> Very good. Thank you for your testimony. I know it is tough to sit before uh, this committee and, and have uh, folks lecture you or ask you questions or both. Um, but uh, thank you so much for, uh, for being an advocate for opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. The Chair would recognize the distinguished gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Murphy. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, uh, congratulations on uh, your first hearing. Um, congratulations to uh, all of you, uh, to Mr. Halassi and Ms. Alvarez specifically. You have done a wonderful job uh, this morning. Uh, and it is uh, a reflection on uh, your commitment uh, to not only your own education, but the education of uh, all of your friends and neighbors, and to Ms. Jackson and Ms. Bennett, I appreciate you being here uh, as well. Let me just first uh, reassure uh, Ms. Jackson and Ms. Bennett, there has been some conversation about, uh, given the uncertainty right now over funding going forward, would there be um, a process in place to make sure that children that are currently in the program now would stay in the program? And we have gotten assurances from the administration. Um, that uh, within uh, the debate going on in Congress today, uh, that the administration is going to do everything in its power to make sure that students that are currently uh, in the program will be able to stay. Um, and I think many of us would uh, uh, be very interested in continuing that conversation. Um, let me just ask a simple question. Um, you know, when we talk about this program, this is uh, uh, clearly about. Um, continuing your commitment to your education, but it is also about making the public school system better. Um, that is the argument for this program. Um, and I would just be interested in your assessment over the now you guys have only been in it for a few years, but as parents and as advocates, you have been watching this program for a series of years. Um, I would be interested as to your assessment as to what this program over the five years that it has been in place has meant to the D.C. public school system? Have you seen the D.C. public school system get better as a result of this program? It's a simple question, but I'd be, uh, you know, maybe I will go first to uh, Ms. Bennett and Ms. Jackson and turn it over to, to you guys, because you certainly have friends and neighbors that are still in the D.C. public school system. I'd be interested as to what you think it is meant for that system. To be honest, I see the D.C. public school system is attempting um, to try. But to, to be frankly honest, from what I've seen, um, and this is just a few schools, I can't say for all, um, this few schools in my area, Ward 8, um, no, they haven't gotten better. They're asking, but no. Ms. Jackson? Um, I agree as well. In, in certain wards, the schools seem to be, I don't want to say pushed aside, but they're not given as much attention as in schools that would be in the, the wards where the majority of the schools are attended by white children. The schools in, the, in Ward 7, Ward 8, and some schools in Ward 6 are underperforming schools because they don't get the attention that they should. And that didn't just happen. It's been that way for years. I've lived in both Wards 8 and Ward 7. And those schools in those wards where my daughter would have to attend now are still underperforming schools. So I see that the D.C. public school system um, are making efforts to make that system better. But now, as it stands, I still would not want my daughter to attend the D.C. public school system. How about you guys? What do you, uh, when you talk to your you know, friends who have been in the public school system, do you get the sense that it's gotten better uh, over the last five years? Ms. Alvarez? Um, I agree with Ms. Bennett and Ms. Jackson. I could see that they are trying to make the schools better, um, but they are not really putting their best foot forward to go all the way and make them the best that they could be, but they are trying. I agree, I agree with Ms. Bennett and Ms. Jackson. It's, it seems that they are attempting, they are trying to make public school, the public school system better, but it's just not to the standards that it, and expectations that it should be at that I will say, okay, I could, I'll, go, I'll go back into the public school system and I'll be, I'll be, I'll be successful, I'll be great. Uh, thank you for, for your comments. The, the idea, obviously, behind 
a voucher system is that it pressures the public school system not just to try, but to actually get better in the end. And um, the reason I ask that question is because the theory sometimes doesn't always match up to the reality. And um, as Mr. Cummings so eloquently stated, the public school system in this nation cannot get better, no matter how many more vouchers that you put into the system, if they don't have the resources to do it, if they don't have the attention to the schools and the neighborhoods that need to uh, get better. And why it is so maddening for some of us to uh, be in Washington today is that, while this is, I think, a very, very useful debate, in other rooms around this Capitol we are having a debate about sucking billions of dollars out of those very schools that we are asking to get better. Uh, and it seems an impossible situation to put schools across this city and across this country uh, in. And I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, you have been incredibly eloquent, and uh, um, I look forward to the rest of the debate. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. And on that, I think everyone can agree. Uh, we cannot thank you enough for your attendance, for your um, eloquence as Mr. Murphy cited for uh, your willingness to share your experience with us. Uh, and what I would propose at this point, um, selfishly, I would like to come thank you in person. So we will take a short recess as the second panel comes forward. Um, and I will be uh, heading down towards you to uh, thank you in person and write notes so you two can go back to school if you want to, okay? <laughs> thank you. We will be in a short recess.